What did the COVID pandemic and the government's clumsy, heavy-handed reaction to it expose about the weaknesses in our society? My guest today describes it as a pandemic of coercion and compliance. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the program. So as you know, we've been very critical of the government's reaction to COVID. It exposed so much about the weaknesses of our society. First and foremost, it exposed the frailty of Canada's government-run healthcare system. We didn't have the capacity, the flexibility, the innovation, or the robustness to handle a novel virus that disproportionately impacted the very old, the very weak, and the very sick. Our reaction to this virus was totalitarian, and I don't mean that to sound hyperbolic. I mean it definitionally. It was total. It was all-encompassing. It demanded complete compliance and submission to a centralized government. That is, after all, the definition of totalitarian. So that meant that for long stretches of time, we shut down our entire society, a decision that disproportionately impacted small children, teenagers, young adults, families, entrepreneurs, business owners, and generally independent-minded Canadians. But healthcare wasn't the only fault line that was exposed during COVID. We saw a colossal failure in leadership across the board, in politics, in government, at all levels of government, the media, big business, and as my guest on the show today experienced firsthand in academia, the universities. So my guest on the show today says that we are living through a pandemic of coercion and compliance. She was very public about being fired from her position at Western and has written a tremendous book called My Choice on the on the Ethics of Forced Vac- Vaccination. So I'm very pleased today to be joined by Dr. Julie Panessi. Julie, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for joining us at Turn North. Thanks so much, Candice. So for those of you who are not familiar with Julie, she's a tremendous individual. She is the pandemic ethics scholar over at the Democracy Fund. Her book is called My Choice, The Ethical Case Against COVID-19 Vaccine Mandates. Prior to her current role, she taught ethics and philosophy at universities in Canada and the U.S. for 20 years, including at Western University and within Western at Huron College. She has published a number of academic papers, in the areas of ancient philosophy, ethical theory, and applied ethics Dr. Panessi has her PhD from Western University. She has a master's in philosophy with a collaborative specialization in bioethics from the University of Toronto, as well as a diploma in ethics from the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University. In 2021, Dr. Panessi refused to comply with Western University's vaccine mandate and thus decided to step away from her academic career. So Julia, I just want to say from reading your bio and reading about you, you seem like a person who is perfectly placed to be um, consulted with and to be in a position to comment on the decision by your university to impose vaccine mandates. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that story about how it was that the university decided to impose this heavy-handed uh, edict and your reaction to it. Right. Well, I mean, of course, I don't know what the decision-making process was like. Uh, I I didn't, as a um, you know, as a member of the philosophy department, see any evidence of a process, a deliberative process. Um, all we got last August was an announcement stating what the COVID policy at Western would be, and that changed a little bit. We got that very late, very close to the start of term, uh, and then it became very clear as classes were about to start just after Labor Day that they were removed the testing option and that vaccination would be required for all uh, faculty, staff, and students. And that was not the personal medical choice I was willing to make. Um, I think there are, you know, I mean, my personal opinion is that there are very serious concerns with the vaccine program itself, and there are serious ethical concerns with the mandates. But, um, you know, this is a much broader, this is a much broader problem, a much broader issue. And one of the things that this highlighted for me, um, you know, my experience working with my department and talking with my chair and the dean uh, was just completely shut out, shut down, ignored. So I wrote a very long detailed letter outlining my concerns with the vaccine mandates. You would expect, uh, I mean, I am the only, one of the only people who teaches anything in the area of ethics at Huron College. 
college. Um, and you would think that someone like that coming forward and expressing ethical concerns about the imposition of these mandates would at least be responded to with some kind of respect and interest. Uh, there was none of that. It was just uh, ignoring. And then when they be when it became clear to them that I wasn't willing to comply with the mandate, they asked point blank, are you not going to comply with this mandate? I said no. And I was terminated very shortly thereafter. So one of the things that this is highlighting is just this closed sort of ecosystem that we are sort of closed eco chamber that we have in academia. And I think it was very interesting in your intro, the way you talked about totalitarianism being quite literally a kind of a total system. And we're seeing that with this COVID response that there is no room for questioning, no room for reflectiveness, no room now that we've been, you know, rolling out this response for a couple of years, there is no, um, sort of intention or action on the part of government, media, or our institutions to look at what we've done and to see how successful it is. I don't know how many people know this, but every province and territory in Canada prior to 2019 had um, a pandemic response plan. And what we did didn't follow any of those plans at all. So if there's a question about whether or not we've been successful, I mean, that's a question that needs to be asked. And even if we think that we have been successful, there's a question, were we as successful as we could have been, as we might have been if we had followed those plans? So there are big, I think, problems in society and the media, government and academia that we are going to spend, I think, decades trying to address. Well, and, and it's it's a good thing because, I mean, it's a good thing that you're doing what you're doing now because had you just simply complied or had the university made an exception for you, you wouldn't have you know, come out with this story. You wouldn't have been able to put the book out and, and really try to attempt to, to have this conversation uh, going. I, I, I note in your book that you you mentioned that 2400 word uh, letter that you wrote. Uh, I believe you wrote it to, to your um, administrators, but also it sounded like to your colleagues. And you, you were sort of disappointed and surprised by the lack of response that, that people either completely ignored you, even though it was like a very well thought out a well-documented, well-cited uh, letter. Uh, they either completely ignored you or they said, look, Health Canada is determining this, not us, like like kind of deferring to an authority. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can sort of w walk us through the initial state of, of sort of your opposition to this, uh, whether the university consulted with you. I mean, you're an ethicist. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what, what an ethicist does and, and, and your area of specific expertise um, and then and then sort of how you were treated in, in that in that moment. Yeah, that's a complicated set of questions. I mean, uh, first of all, so your point about whether or not, um, you know, the university is just deferring to Health Canada, that's all I saw, right? That's the only explanation that I've seen from not just universities, but from places of employment, uh, and really from the government itself, right, as an explanation for why they're, why they're imposing a mandate. It's well, because Health Canada says so. The interesting and troubling thing about that is then we can ask, well, where does Health Canada get its information from, if not from academics and research? and people who primarily work at universities. And so there's a, there's a circular problem there, right? If we are closing off the possibility of intellectuals having the opportunity to engage with the directives coming from our government, then we are entering a new kind of society that I don't think many of us believed we, we lived in before, right? Um, your question about, you know, what do ethicists do? That's a, really, that's a really good and interesting question. So there are sort of ethicists in two different senses of the word. Um, there are practical ethicists who work in hospitals or in engineering firms or business ethicists who work for, for business companies. Um, and then there are academic ethicists, so people who teach ethics at university. And that's what I did primarily. I have done things like I've sat on, on ethics boards at hospitals uh, and things like that. But primarily, I taught ethics at university. And what, what you do when you're teaching ethics or thinking about ethics is to think about whether or not what you're doing is the best possible course of action. So we're not asking about what's factual, what's actually happening or what's possible to do, but we're asking about what we ought to do. And that has to do with producing good and bad. It has to do with helping people to live lives that are 
the best, that live lives that are happy, uh, to, to make sure that we aren't hurting people. But that isn't only it, right? We're also interested in focusing on things like human flourishing. What does it mean to develop a good character? What does it mean to live a good life? And Certainly the thing I wanted to do or I aspired to most as an instructor was to help not to teach students didactically what the answers to those questions are, but to help them to develop the kind of mind that can ask those questions for themselves. And that comes from, a, I mean, that goes way back to ancient Greece. It comes, you know, it's a 2000 year old tradition that started with philosophers like Plato and Socrates and Aristotle of asking questions about what the good life, what is good for humans. And we seem to have decided now that the only people who are entitled to answer that questions are scientists. And by the way, only particular scientists, only the ones who happen to follow a particular narrative. And so that is closing off not only all other disciplines, but it's closing off scientists who actually have reasonable disagreement with the mainstream uh, narrative that we're seeing now. So do you think this is something that was just that, that was just exposed to you during COVID or is this like a longstanding sort of slide? Because I mean, I, I went to university in like the early 2000s and mid 2000s and I, I didn't get taught much about sort of ethics and virtue and those guys I did a degree in political science and economics. Um, you, you know, even even political philosophy classes, that, that wasn't really the focus. It seems to me it's, it's you know, left to science to, to determine the sort of big existential questions or perhaps religion, but religion isn't really filling in that uh, that void in our society. So I'm wondering, wh when do you think that this shift happened, and and what's been going on in the universities? Uh, yes, yeah, so I was a bit, back? I was a bit naive. I was under the impression that if you know, uh, freedom of expression and freedom of ideas, and the exchange of ideas existed anywhere, it would be at our universities. And part of the reason I went into academia is that I was very inspired by some very uh, courageous, free, beautiful thinkers. Um, and and I don't think I really realize the degree to which that has changed over the last twenty or so years, but it's certainly has changed. Um, now, if you're an academic and you go to a conference, uh, I mean, I haven't been to one in a few years now, but the last time I went, honestly, academics are not terribly interested in exchanging ideas. They're interested in uh, voicing their opinion. So talking, not listening, and then turning to their phones and not listening to whoever happens to be speaking. And I know that sounds a bit trite, but I think that's kind of the modus operandi in the academic world now. It's, well, here's my idea. I'm going to put it into the sphere. Oh, and by the way, it follows you know, the, um, the ethos of a particular genre that I happen to be in. Um, and there's very little robust exchange of ideas. Probably the very first thing that suggested to me that there's something odd going on here is that there has been no disagreement, no reasonable disagreement among academics over the last two years about the COVID response. And prior to that, you could not get academics to agree about anything. And that's exactly how it should be. Right, because, um, you know, I mean, I think one thing academics do have agreed about historically is that the truth is hard to access. It's hard to understand and we have to work hard at that. And to do that, we have to be willing to um, present different hypotheses and follow them to their logical conclusions. And when they don't work out, reevaluate and try something else. And so the idea that there are very, very few academics. You know, there's another bioethicist in the U United States, Aaron Cariati, uh, who's a, also a medical doctor. He worked at the U University of California, Irvine, and he was also terminated for his um, opposition to the, uh, to the COVID response. Uh, but other than that, it seems as though all bioethicists, all ethicists globally are in lockstep with the government's pandemic response. And that is to put it very uh, non-technically weird. <laughs> weird. Well, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's shocking because like you say, you expect to have a robust exchange of ideas. You expect people to disagree. I'm wondering why, like why was it that when COVID came around, you know, we, we didn't know what it was. We didn't know what it what the long-term impact was. We didn't know what the impact on our society was going to be. So it makes sense that we would be incredibly cautious and perhaps fearful. Uh, but, you know, as time went on, we, we learned so much about the virus. We learned so much about how it spreads. Uh, you know, we, we just generally learned things that worked and things that didn't work. 
and, and yet, uh, we, you know, we, we, we didn't see m more and more voices come out. I, I mean, maybe, maybe there have been more, more dissenting voices, but, but still, there, there, there is sort of this major push. So I'm, I'm just wondering, like, why did, why did it happen this way, do you think? Well, I think you're right that there has been an enormous amount of fear surrounding the COVID um, situation. I think that's probably partly because there isn't a dialogue. We aren't being presented with two sides of the story. Um, when information comes out that suggests, as you mentioned earlier, that um, you know COVID does not affect all people equally, that it disproportionately, there's a stratified risk, right? And it affects people who are elderly or who have comorbidities, other health conditions. Um, that should be good news to the vast majority of people. It should also suggest that the restrictions we impose on people, which have downsides themselves, like masking and lock, locking down children and preventing them from going to school, that you need to balance those harms against the benefit that come from uh, protecting them from, from COVID, arguably. And when it becomes more and more clear that children aren't at significant risk from contracting COVID, then the harms of the um, COVID protections become weightier and weightier, right? And, and so it's, it's a little bit odd, it's very odd actually, that when you present to someone evidence to show that you're not actually at significant risk from getting seriously ill or dying from COVID, the rational response would be, oh, well, that's great news. Wow, I, I feel a little bit better now. That's not the response that we're seeing. We're just seeing people ignoring that information and doubling down with fear. And our government and our media um, have been all too happy to support that. Um, I don't know if you will have heard, but yesterday, a very influential article came out in the Canadian Medical Association journal. Uh, it's called The Impact of Population Mixing Between the Vaccinated and the Unvaccinated. It was written uh, by three authors. One is David Fisman, who's uh, sat, sat in the Ontario Science Table. He's an epidemiologist at the uh, Dalai Lama School of Health in Toronto. And um, it basically argues that it's the reason why we're seeing infection among the vaccinated still is because there are so many unvaccinated people, right? Um, someone you know, there are, there are a couple of things, there are many things that are alarming about this article, uh, not the least of which is the way the unvaccinated are written about. We could be reading about, um, you know, apartheid uh, between racial groups, uh, you know, 50 years ago. Um, but one thing I think people are not very skeptical about, rationally skeptical about, is the fact that someone like David Fisman sits on the advisory boards of the very vaccine companies that he is defending in that academic article, right? Also, a rational person might look at that article and say, maybe there's something going on with the immune systems of the vaccinated people. Maybe that's why they're getting higher rates of infection than the pe people who are, are um, unvaccinated. And my point about that is only that um, we need to temper the fear that we have with not just information, but with our mind working on that information and deciding for ourselves whether or not that's the kind of information that should fuel more fear or less fear. And I think this rampant fear that we've experienced is just a kind of, there's a kind of collective hysteria. And people have felt sort of um, unmoored from a kind of stability, right, that allows us to look at evidence and say, well, maybe we're going to be okay here if we just do this, this, and this, right? Um, and that kind of rational approach to our health, the rational approach to dealing with other people, rational approach to engagement in the public sphere just seems to have been lost over the last couple of years. Well, it, it always struck me as a little ironic that the people who were most fearful and paranoid about COVID were also the most trusting of a vaccine that came out. And it's like, you know, I, I can get why you're worried about COVID, given the sort of uh, ramping up of fear in both uh, politics, government and media. They push this like, and, you know, the idea of a politician is to lead you away from fear. Like there's things to be fearful of in your life every single day. And the idea behind someone who's leading you is to say, look, we're gonna go forward despite this fear and we're gonna, we're gonna persevere. Uh, whereas during COVID we had the opposite. Um, I, I'm just wondering in, in, in your, I know you wrote in your book that um, there was sort of a confluence of 
like the post 9-11 big government security state that, that pushed this idea that the government can protect us and keep us safe. Um, but then we also had the increasingly corporatist mindset of big businesses and people, people trusting big business. But the exact type of people as well that you would expect to push back against big pharma, to push back against a government edict that, that imposes a vaccine, those were some of the people that were the biggest cheerleaders of it and the biggest enforcers of this social norm that you must get vaccinated and you must not question the science. I'm, I'm wondering, did, did that surprise you? Um, and w what do you think led to that sort of switch? And I'm, t I'm talking about people on the left, people who you know, are supposed to be skeptical of big government, big corporations, and now all of a sudden they're the ones that are often cheerleading and, and pushing you know, the corporate government line. I agree. That's very weird. I mean, historically, it has been people on the left, uh, liberals or classical liberals, at least, who have focused on individual freedom and autonomy. And now we're seeing those people move completely sort of to the other side, we might say, and focus on a lack of autonomy. And it's it's more of this collectivist mentality, sacrifice yourself for the group. But of course, um, you know, I mean, I've heard it said among sort of people on the right that there's this problem with collectivism and we shouldn't have to sacrifice ourselves for the group, but that's only part of the problem, right? Another part of the problem is that it isn't clear that science supports the idea that the people who are, say, getting vaccinated and wearing masks are helping the group, right? I think there's as much scientific evidence to suggest that those actions are actually working to reduce uh, people's immunity rather than build it up. So this is not just a, an individualist or collectivist autonomy versus, um, you know, altruism uh, debate. It's also a debate about whether or not we are appropriately uptaking the information that we're seeing and having that um, sort of feedback into our current mental states and, and whether how fearful we're, we're uh, allowing ourselves to be, right? And, um, you know, we've not, um, we, we haven't seen any emphasis for the last two years on things like civil liberties. You know, when you talk about pe people having the freedom of, of belief, freedom of expression, freedom of, freedom of the press, freedom of communication. I mean, these are things that they're not just luxuries. They're not dispensable in times of crisis. The reason why they're codified in our constitution is because they are more needed during times of crisis than any other time, because without them, these kinds of um, sort of unrestricted ideas, this kind of totalitarianism as we began with, just run rampant and get us to a place that is not only harmful, but, but quite irrational, right? I'm wondering what, what, why you think that there wasn't more of a robust discussion and debate when it came to the effic efficacy, the ethics, and the uh, safety of vaccines when they first come out. I know you wrote in your book that uh, in the last 30 years, more than one third of all adverse reactions to vaccines have been with the COVID vaccine. There's been over 6,000 injuries. And I, I don't know exactly when your book came out, but I, I imagine that there's more now. There's been over 200 deaths. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can elaborate on the point you made in the book and, and maybe comment on why we didn't have a more robust discussion about that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's kind of a two pronged question. So I guess one answer is, well, why, or one question is, why haven't we seen more people step up to challenge um, the narrative? Um, the short answer to that is some have, and they have been very quickly and efficiently shut down. And I think that has sent a strong message to other people who realize very quickly that if they challenge the narrative, they will lose their job their reputation, their friends, their family, their income, right? There, there isn't room in our society currently, um, not just to challenge the narrative, but to ask questions about it. Um, we saw a member of the Toronto Board of Health back in October, October, November, I can't remember exactly, um, ask questions about how we're treating the unvaccinated in one of our major national newspapers. And she re received just a storm, an onslaught of criticism and ended up really recoiling uh, and retracting that position and chose not to, not to uh, run for re-election her position. So across the board, people who, you know, I challenged it, I was fired with cause. Right? I mean, this is what happens to people who speak out. Now, a further question is, well, how did we get to the place where we punish dissenters like that or we punish what we might call outliers? Well, that is a bigger question. And that, I think, has been in the works uh, for decades. Of course, 
the fact that um, we have this kind of regulatory capture within medicine. So we have uh, people like David Fisman, who's supposed to be, you know, an academic who is supposed to be objectively evaluating data is sitting on an advisory board for the companies who are producing the data that he's supposed to be evaluating, right? And we have that happening across the board. We have it happening in the States. Um, it's, but I think that's not a recent phenomenon, right? We, we saw this with the opioid epidemic, uh, the SSRI crisis, that um, Big Pharma, as you mentioned, has certainly been very influential um, in not just our medical choices, but our scientific, our political, our societal choices and, and, and movements over the last several decades, really. So that is a very big question. I don't think we're going to understand, have an answer to it probably for a very long time, but, but the first step is to become aware of it. And so when an article like the one that came out yesterday comes out, as opposed to saying, oh my goodness, um, this is more reason to be fearful. Let's look at the fine print, the disclaimer at the bottom of the page and realize there might be a conflict of interest at work here. Well, it looks like just another opportunity to demonize and dehumanize the unvaccinated and say this is all their fault. And we saw that throughout the pandemic. I wanted to ask you specifically about our prime minister, Justin Trudeau, because we all know in the election, he infamously said that the unvaccinated are extremists. They don't believe in science. They're often misogynist. They're racist. It's a small group that muscles in and we have uh, to make a choice in terms of this country, do we tolerate these people, right? We know that during the trucker convoy, he came out and flat out said that these people are Nazis. If you're protesting against my vaccine policies, you are a Nazi. Uh, and, and then even worse, the media echoed these concerns and they didn't uh, make any attempt to you know, push back or hold a prime minister accountable for his willfully uh, divisive and dangerous claims. Yeah, that's a big problem. I, I have nothing good to say about our prime minister. I mean, this is someone we need to keep in mind was elected primarily because he had nice hair from what I understand. We need to be very careful moving forward that we don't make that kind of mistake again. I've also made it a point not to respond to those kinds of comments that he makes. I'm not going to exert energy to try to defend the unvaccinated and show why they are not, you know, ex extremists or misogynists. Um, Justin Trudeau needs to, you know, the onus is on him. If he wants to make that claim, he has to provide evidence to show that everyone who is unvaccinated is also a misogynist, is also a Nazi. And until he's willing to do that work, which I'm sure he is not willing to do, then I'm not going to engage. Well, good for you. I think uh, I think that's right. I don't think it's worthy. Uh, he's worthy of the response. My, my criticism is with the media and how they take his his perspective and they just push it as if it's the mainstream. I mean, Justin Trudeau came onto the scene, you know, pushing back against the Harper government, uh, who who at the time was trying to fight down the scientists, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that kind of stuff. But then also, uh, you know, Har Harper was trying to take a hard line against ISIS and growing Islamist extremism. And Justin Trudeau said, you know, we have to defend rights uh, when it's popular and when it's not popular is talking about giving a terrorist um, convicted at Guantanamo Bay uh, a settlement and an apology. So Trudeau used to sort of speak for the very um, outliers and the marginalized people, and and, and now he's, he's demonizing them. So I, I know in your book, you also talk about how COVID triggered crises in other institutions, uh, uh, you know, as well, uh, not just academia, but also journalism, government, and more broadly, civil discourse. So I'm wondering if you could uh, talk about that, but also talk about how we can mend these wounds, how we can move forward as a society, how we can uh, get back to a place where we all trust each other, we like each other, and we want to live side by side as Canadians and, and, and respect each other. Yeah, this is the point where, where we're asking for hope and solutions moving forward, right? Um, you know, I spent a long time being very frustrated with the personal, particular person that is our prime minister. Uh, and I've gotten to the point now where I realize that, you know, he as an individual is relatively inconsequential. If he resigned now, there would be another person very much like him um, to run as the leader of the Liberal Party or, or the or the NDP party. Um and very likely win. And that's because I think, I won't say the majority of Canadians, but a crucial enough majority of Canadians have decided that it's good to be ruled by someone with the mentality. 
And that, and, and why is that, you know, part of what he did um, during his campaign was, was to demonize the unvaccinated and to, and to protect those who choose to be vaccinated against them and say things like, don't think that we're going to let, you know, you sit on a plane together or sit next to each other on a train. And I think that the, you know, the election last fall told us that most Canadians or enough, right, want that. They want a certain subset of our population to be demonized and held accountable for their problems. And until we can move beyond that or move through that, understand why that is not the case and why even if it was the case, arguably, that epidemiologically, the unvaccinated were responsible for the persistence of this virus. To be very clear, I don't think we've seen evidence to suggest that. But if even if that's the case, arguably, there is still room, there's still responsibility in politics and public discourse. And part of what it is to be a citizen, to respect other people, to try to understand their choices, to keep talking with them. And, you know, prior to the last couple of years, we talked in ethics, in academic, academic ethic literature, a lot about virtues of tolerance and patience. And we don't talk about those things anymore, right? And so tolerance is, is a very difficult virtue because it requires you to still engage with people whose positions you don't understand. And that requires an awful lot of work. It requires, um, you know, minimizing your anger for the sake of being able to truly listen to other people. And truly listening is, is, is something that we've, it's an art that we've lost, I think. Um, we need to get it back. How do we get it back? Our education system is crucial. And I don't just mean university, but our elementary and high school educations need to be better at, at teaching these virtues, I think, about, about listening. We need to understand why history is so important, because we have been in the past through times like this, where citizens have been at odds with one another. And we need to review those moments in history to understand how we moved through them and how we resolved those conflicts and the harm that we can do when we stop listening to each other. So there is hope, I think, but we need to think in fundamentally different, not really novel ways. I mean, we've, we've had success at this in the past, but we need to think in very different ways about how we understand each other, how we approach each other, um, and what right we have to demand of someone else that they sacrifice their life to make us feel safe and protected. Well, I, I'm glad that you still, after all of this, ha have some hope about how we can um, right the system. And it's interesting because, you know, at, at the same time as all this is happening with COVID and the lockdowns and the vaccine mandates, there's another sort of social trend towards diversity and inclusion and this idea that we have to tolerate all kinds of unique people with different identities and different, you know, biological traits or feelings about their biology. And, and, and we're told that we have to tolerate that and understand that. Um, and then yet when it comes to you know, choices that someone makes or their lifestyle or the things that they choose, uh, when, when it comes to like, we're talking about vaccines, we don't have that tolerance. So it's, it's interesting we're pushing one and then completely neglecting another. I don't know. It, so either there's a double standard and a kind of hypocrisy at work, right? Or we may have decided that what we are obligated to tolerate are certain kinds of differences and not other ones. Right. So maybe what we feel we're obligated to tolerate are physical differences, but not ideological ones. And it certainly seems as though, um, you know, we, we have a very low tolerance for religious differences, for example, for cultural differences, for, um, you know, people who choose um, certain um certain fashions that are dictated by their religion. And we now are seeing how little tolerance we have for diversity of ideas, right? And so I don't know, um, either we're hypocritical or we have a very clear idea about um, what we tolerate and what we don't tolerate. Of course, racism and gender um, differences are, you know, high on the list of things that we are expected to tolerate these ideas these days. But again, I think religious philosophical uh, differences in ideology are not only things that we're not expected to tolerate, but they are things that we are are bad for tolerating. Right, we're just I, I, fueling a kind of disinformation system if we tolerate that kind of diversity. 
Right. It's like a very superficial form of, of diversity that we like to champion. It's like diversity for people who look different, but they have to think exactly like me. A final question for you, Julia. I'm wondering if there's anything out there that gives you hope, anything that inspires, what, like what is it that inspires you and keeps you going? I know you deal with a lot of adversity and you deal with a lot of bad news. I'm wondering what, uh, what is it that gives you hope? Do I ever? <laughs> Boy. Uh, yes. I mean, every day I get messages from people who who tell me about how, you know, our response to COVID is uh, ruining their lives, you know, and, and I think we need to be better at paying attention to all the harms that we're doing. I mean, getting sick from COVID is not the only possible harm that can happen to a person. And outside of the realm of COVID, you know, people, you know, they get, they get very serious illnesses. You can get in car accidents. There's drowning incident, you know, I mean, and, and never mind that we have a, a children's mental health crisis and we have unprecedented levels of uh, obesity and alcoholism and addiction and the list goes on. Um, but, you know, through all of that, there are people who have at the risk of losing their jobs, losing their families, losing their reputation, have just said um, nothing is worse, worse than losing who I am as a person. And they have stuck it through and decided that this is my choice. This is who I am. I'm willing to lose everything, including possibly my life over this. And those are the that's the only source of hope in our society right now. Um, I hope they have the strength to carry us forward through what might be coming over the next year or so. Um, it certainly takes an awful lot of moral stamina and endurance and resilience. Um, I do see, you know, people having success talking with trusted family members or friends and having some success, having more reasonable conversations and, uh, you know, having a, maybe a, a brother who two years ago said, um, well, if you hold that view, then I think you're crazy and I'm not willing to talk to you and switching and now to saying, well, maybe we disagree, but disagreement is a social good. Or maybe to saying even something like, you know, I didn't see what you saw a couple of years ago and now I see it and I'm really glad we've been talking. So there, there is hope for sure, um, but we can't give up yet by any means because our country is not what it was two years ago and probably is not what it was 20 or 30 years ago. And, you know, I want to leave everybody with a thought. I came across an interview that Johnny Carson did with President Reagan in 1975. And he, they, you know, they were in major crisis then too, about whether or not the government was spending too much or not spending enough. And Johnny Carson said to, uh, to, to Mr. Reagan at the time, you know, what is the problem here? And President Reagan said, you know, the problem is everybody's looking to government to provide solutions to the problem, but government is the problem. And I think we have a very similar phenomenon now that we, for some reason, want the government to step in and fix all of our problems for us. And the government, don't forget, is just a collection of human beings. We're all imperfect. And there's no reason to think that our government is any more perfect than any other collection of human beings. And I think we need to pull back, take more responsibility for our own lives, take more responsibility for scrutinizing information that comes to us, especially now we know that there is such a coordinated, um, you know, effort among mainstream media to deliver the same information, which is in lockstep with our government. Um, so there's more onus on us than ever before to do our own research and to take responsibility for our own lives. Well, I think that's a great uh, note to end, end the interview on. I think there's so much uh, wisdom in that idea that, that people can solve problems on their own better than referring to some all-powerful uh, institution that, that you, you might not, not always agree with the direction it's going and the, and the way that they use that power. So, uh, Dr. Prasi, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for all the work that you do over at the Democracy Fund, and uh, thank you for joining the show. Absolutely. Thanks so much. All right, that's Dr. Julie Panessi with the Democracy Fund. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show.